Our brains prefer to run on glucose. It may come as a surprise, but fats don't cross through the blood-brain barrier. We don't utilize fats in the brain. In some circumstances, we can utilize ketones, but that's a discussion for a different day. Generally speaking, our brains run on glucose. So that would imply that if we have so much glucose coming in through the diet that our brain is gonna be supercharged, right? Not quite the case. We have to remember one very important thing, okay? A fast brain is a relaxed brain, okay? And we don't wanna be bombarding it with a bunch of energy and a bunch of glucose. That could actually backfire on us. There's some research to back it up, but we run into a pretty big issue. Unfortunately, when it comes down to the brain, we can't look at every single chemical reaction that's occurring in the brain in a given circumstance. We can look at fMRI scans and see which regions of the brain are activated and things like that, but it's very hard to see exactly what is going on. So we rely on longer tail observational research, which we'll talk about a bit more in this video. But when you talk about cognitive function, there is some evidence that especially if you are dealing with insulin resistance, which unfortunately a lot of us are, even shorter term, like high amounts of glucose, can negatively impact cognitive function. Let's take a look at that research. So this first study was published in the British Journal of Nutrition, and it was done on type two diabetics. They took a look at 803 participants, and they gave them a battery of different neuropsychological tests, okay? So they gave them a bunch of different psychological evaluations to kind of test their cognitive function. What they found with this is that increased sugar intake led to decreases in spatial working memory, decreases in working memory altogether, decreases in scanning and tracking, and decreases in what are called executive function, which just like the name implies. That's executive function is like very important. It's like kind of orchestrating everything that's going on in our brain. What's very interesting with this is they found that diet soda did not have this effect. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of diet soda, but what's interesting is that they found that higher sugar intake and soda intake that was sugary did negatively affect cognitive function. Now this is correlation, doesn't equal causation, right? But this is kind of the stuff we have to look at. That's why maybe when you have a big bunch of sugar or a bunch of carbohydrates, you might feel good for a minute and then you kind of come crashing down. But the type of carbohydrate matters too. There's another study that was published in the British Journal of Nutrition, took a look at 74 school age kids and it gave them either a high glycemic load, so a fair amount of carbohydrates, or a low glycemic load and within those categories, they did high glycemic index carbohydrates, so higher blood glucose spiking carbohydrates, or lower blood glucose spiking carbohydrates, and they measured about 90 to 115 minutes later, and they found that, what do you know? The group that had the higher glycemic carbohydrates was more associated with, well, being less happy, but also just lesser cognitive function. They found the lower GI meal predicted more alertness and ultimately more happiness. So pretty interesting stuff, but again, the mechanisms, we can't look at someone's chemical reactions within the brain. So we have to kind of like piecemeal some of the data together. Now there was an interesting study that was published in the journal Alzheimer's Disease. Now this study took a look at 930 normal elderly participants. So people that didn't have any kind of cognitive decline or anything like that. Okay, now it followed them for four years. And every 15 months, they took a look at these people and they gave them uh, a 128 food questionnaire, basically what kind of foods do you typically eat, as well as different sort of neuropsychological batteries, like different tests. What they found and they wanted to measure was like, what is happening in terms of macronutrient consumption and cognitive decline? Well, of the 200 people that ended up developing some level of mild cognitive decline, they found that the risk of cognitive impairment was increased significantly if they had a larger percentage of their diet coming from carbohydrates whereas those that had a larger percentage of their diet coming from fats had less risk of mild cognitive decline. Again, correlation doesn't equal causation, but we have to look at like, the big picture here and what's happening over the longer term. Because when you look at like four year studies like that that really look at overall consumption and what people are eating on the regular, it really paints a pretty big picture. Playing devil's advocate, one of the things that we have to look at is what is called like a neuronal cell membrane and what allows a brain to function quickly and efficiently. We have like this super highway of of nerve transmission and signal transduction and synapses and neurons all working together, right? Well, think of it like a network of highways in a big city, okay? If the speed limit is 35 miles per hour in those highways, things aren't able to get around the city very fast. But if the speed limit is 100 miles an hour and people aren't crashing, well, things are gonna get to their destinations faster. Well, there's this thing called myelination. And this myelination is like allowing these signals to transmit faster and more efficiently. 
Well, unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately for some, fats are required for this myelination, right? So one could argue that it's not necessarily the overconsumption of the carbohydrates. Maybe it's the lack of consumption of the fats and the lack of consumption of the proteins that are required for neurotransmitter building and function. So maybe there's that argument. But when you start looking at the longer term studies on diabetics and those that are insulin resistant, it becomes more and more clear that it's really about dysfunctional carbohydrate metabolism really coming as a result of insulin resistance. Now you can monitor these kinds of things as time goes on by looking at your glucose levels, right? You can prick your finger, you can watch your glucose levels there and see how you respond to food, and you can make changes to your diet, you can make changes to your exercise, because I do think that we need to monitor that compared to just demonizing carbohydrates. Because people are going to respond to different carbohydrates in different ways. For example, a banana might spike my blood glucose, but a banana doesn't spike yours, and vice versa, right, with different foods. It all depends on the person, all depends on the gut microbiome, there's a lot of different things. So always, always do what you can to track where your glucose is at. Today, after this video, you can save 30% off your entire grocery order through Thrive Market. That means if you go out and you wanna load up your grocery cart with $500 worth of food, you'll save 30% off of it. They're an online grocery store that everything just gets delivered to your doorstep, but you can sort by diet category. It's the coolest, easiest thing that I've seen in a long time when it comes down to healthy grocery shopping. So right now with food prices the way they are, things getting expensive, gas being crazy expensive, I'm really all about ordering my food and getting it delivered to my doorstep. Okay, so it makes things just way simpler for me. So Thrive Market, using that link, you save 30% off your entire grocery order, plus it's foods that I endorse and condone because they really are better for you options. So highly recommend that that link will save you 30% off, plus you get a $50 free gift when you check them out. So use that link down below. Now there was a longer term study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care. This took a look at 7,148 people that did not have dementia or cognitive decline and did not have type two diabetes. And they took a look at their baseline insulin levels. They also took a look at their cognitive function, like where they were at baseline. And they followed up with these people at three and six years. And they found that once again, hyperinsulinemia was definitely associated with cognitive decline. When you double that with a study that was published in Alzheimer's Research and Therapy, okay, they determined that insulin resistance, peripheral insulin resistance, played a role in worsening hippocampal glucose metabolism and lower volume of gray matter. So if you have less glucose metabolism in the hippocampal region, okay, what that means is that you have less sugar or glucose being able to be utilized. So you're seeing the problem here. It's not the carbohydrate itself. It's the overconsumption of the carbohydrates that are potentially burning out our ability to be sensitive to those carbohydrates. So then the carbohydrates go to the brain, the glucose goes to the brain, and the hippocampus region or given regions of the brain can't utilize the glucose well because they've become insulin resistant just like the other tissues in our body. And then you see the subsequent reduction in gray matter volume where you might actually see atrophying of the brain. So this is very fascinating stuff when we start looking longer term at cognitive decline and how we just seem to kind of lose that executive function a little bit more as we get older. Now, what is going on sort of at a molecular level? There was a study that was published in the journal Drugs that took a look at this and found that in a lot of cases, there can be tissue atrophy, there can also be just neurodegeneration in general, but also something called neuroinflammation, which we're gonna talk about in a second, because that could be a very big piece. How does insulin resistance interplay with neuroinflammation? Okay, it sounds like super complex, like neuro, neurochemistry, right? But neuroinflammation is pretty straightforward. If you have inflammation in the brain, that is neuroinflammation. But how does insulin resistance play into that? Well, what seems to be going on is when you are insulin resistant, there is a down regulation in what is called PPAR delta. Normally I'm talking about PPAR alpha, but PPAR delta is very important in this case. So when insulin acts upon the PPAR delta or passes through it, it's essentially sending a signal to have normal function of a cell, normal function of a brain cell. It's a normal process because once again, the brain is supposed to run on glucose. So if insulin is present and it's acting upon this, it's signaling that the brain is normal and the cells should operate normally. When you're insulin resistant, you have less insulin, which means a down regulation of this PPAR, which can lead to neurodegeneration, this neuroinflammation once again, and an increase in what's called beta amyloid plaque, which is largely associated, again, we see that with Alzheimer's and 
those kinds of situations. Now, when everything is operating normally, when you're insulin sensitive, you have the upregulation of PPAR, of this nuclear receptor protein. That makes it so that the brain is having normal function, right? So essentially, we have these increases in oxidative stress, this increase in neuroinflammation, which negatively impacts how the brain sends signals and communicates with regions of one another, right? Different regions of the brain can't communicate well with one another when there's a lot of inflammation. But with that, we have to look at oxidative stress as well. Okay, oxidative stress is where we have so much in the way of free radicals that it's negatively impacting our body. Well, we have oxidative stress that happens in the brain too. And there are a lot of studies that demonstrate that oxidative stress in the brain is not good short term or long term. But insulin resistance plays a big role in this too. So insulin resistance is basically impairing this pathway that is signaling for the brain cells to operate normally. Essentially, you're blocking messages that would normally get to a brain cell and therefore stopping the brain cell from going through what's called apoptosis, where it's sort of a premature or sort of sudden cell death. If you are blocking the message from insulin because you're insulin resistant, then you can have more of this apoptosis occur, meaning these cells just randomly die. Not a good thing when it comes down to neurons, not a good thing at all. You don't want brain cells to just self-destruct and die. Okay, very bad thing. Obviously, this is going to be a huge detriment. Also, insulin resistance is going to affect different pathways that ultimately affect what's called NRF2 expression. When NRF2 expression is altered, then you're changing how proteins are really seen and received within a cell which leads to the cell functioning sort of in a dysfunctional way, which leads to an increase in reactive oxygen species, so more ROS within the brain. And then lastly within this, if the mitochondria, the actual energy powerhouse within a cell, cannot process glucose well because it's dysfunctional and because there's insulin resistance, that dysfunctional mitochondria then starts to process fuel poorly. So think about a vehicle that runs efficiently and emits a certain level of exhaust. Now you have that same vehicle running into all kinds of mechanical issues and it's blowing out black smoke. It's creating a lot more exhaust, reactive oxygen species. So when your cells don't know how to process glucose very well, you run into a big issue with this. Now this is where having lower levels of glucose and higher levels of ketones can come into play, right? Because there is some interesting evidence in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that demonstrated that higher ketone levels can actually stabilize what's called network stability and allow regions of the brain to communicate better and more efficiently with one another even when levels of glucose are lower. So my point in saying all of this isn't to say go low carb or go ketogenic, but it really is to keep a keep a little tempering on how much of the carbohydrates you're taking in consistently throughout the day because if you're really watching your cognitive function over the long haul it's really important to pay attention to just your overall aggregate carbohydrate intake and how it's affecting your levels of insulin resistance as time goes on so as always keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow